You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. For those of you that are online Pet Health members, you'll know that every single month we load our Research Refresh, which is a training looking at research articles in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. So this month we got one of our favorite lecturers, Carrie Adrian, to help us out with our Research Refresh. So she looked at multiple research articles, all focused around the topic of cryotherapy. It was a really interesting Research Refresh. And so Anae Lloyd from Online Pet Health decided to get her onto a podcast to dive deep into this topic and to ask you a few more questions. You guys are going to enjoy this one. Over to Carrie and Anae. Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. So, Carrie, you've just recorded a research refresh for us on cryotherapy, which had me sitting on the edge of my seat. So, would you please tell our listeners a little bit about what they can expect from watching this research refresh? Sure thing. Well, I, I don't know about you all out there, but I, I think with all this COVID stuff going on that we're all kind of scratching at the window. And, and, you know, I'm on my fourth cup of coffee on a Friday morning and to sit and pick an article and have to go through it, you know, word from word. And, and quite frankly, it can be a little dry, right, gang? So Megan and I talked about doing something different. Um, to me, it's a little bit more clinically meaningful to take the last 20 years of literature and to really review it. And and something that I talked about in the the webinar and the the research refresh is, you know, I think I think we get a little complacent when with our clinical practice. You know, you're trying to get through the day, you've got 10, 12, 14 patients, you just need to get through it. So we do we end up doing um, what's comfortable whether it's right or wrong. So what Megan and I discussed is, hey, let's let's look at everything and see how we can apply this clinically. That may actually change our perception of the way we treat our patients. So when it comes to review of the literature, it's not just one article. You know, I don't, for me personally, I don't get a whole lot out of the journal clubs. We've all sat through them you know, probably doing five other things while we're listening in the background. I get it. (laughs) Um, So I wanted to do more of a a clinical research and review, which essentially is taking the literature from the last 20 years, honing it down and and critically reviewing it all to say, here's my take home points. Here's two, three, four, five things that we can do in the clinic. I think you're very right, um, and especially on a subject where there is a larger body of um, of research on, and of evidence, it doesn't help for us to really just look at one or even two research articles. We need to look at everything that's out there. So, right. yeah. <laughs> um, Carrie, the, what are the different techniques that they were using in these papers to apply ice? So I know there, like, there are so many ways that we could do it. Um, what were they, what did they study? Yeah, the, the, the canine articles primarily focused on traditional ice packs, uh, a bandage of some sort, whether it was a Robert Jones or just an elastic bandage to provide the, the compression component of it, or mm-hmm. some of the, what they call the advanced cryotherapeutics, which are the cold compression units that you're going to spend more money with. So they can be thousands of dollars versus you know, a $5 ice pack that you can print your name and and logo on and sell it to a client. So those are more of the traditional types of techniques. I didn't see a whole lot of um, uh, immersion, uh, you know, cold baths, um, the the ice application. I didn't see a lot of, of those. The majority of it was a standard ice pack or your cold compression therapy units. Okay. Um, all right. And, and in terms of clinical outcomes or outcome measures in these research papers, um, you spoke a lot about edema, and that was one of the things that that's like most of them were looking at and, and most of them were measuring. But 
And you touched on this, but really what is the significance of edema when we're coming at it from a, from a clinical standpoint and from a healing standpoint over time? What, what is the importance of that for us in those first 72 hours? Right. You know, the, the question is, so what? You know, so, so looking through all of this information, you know, my bottom line is, well, well, who cares if we're reducing edema? Who cares if we're, we're lowering the intraarticular temperature? And so for me, it was a bit of a smack in the face, like, oh, yeah, that, that makes total sense that, you know, if, if we're seeing a reduction of swelling, well, well, what does that mean clinically? You know, does that mean the dog's range of motion is improved? Does that mean this dog is going to ambulate better or faster or the lameness score has, has dropped? So those were more, you know, functionally, of course, as, as a PT, we, we look at function and the importance of function. So what I gleaned from a lot of these papers is just because we have reduction of, of inflammation on a cellular level doesn't necessarily mean that it's benefiting our patients clinically. So we're not just doing cryotherapy either. You know, we're, we're doing a lot of other things. So is it just cryotherapy that's, that's causing a more beneficial performance of our patient functionally? And, and I, I mentioned too in the, the, the webinar that I... I question, is range of motion even an issue? So, you know, taking post-op TPLOs, is that truly an issue for our patients? One week, two weeks, immediately post-op, you know, well, what does that mean in the first 72 hours? If we reduce swelling, is my dog going to be walking better at two weeks post? Well, well what does that mean? You know, so, so long-term, I think, you know, we, these dogs' functions are pretty darn good, even at the, the two-week mark even at the eight week mark when they go back for an x-ray. So, so who cares, you know, what, what does reduction of swelling really mean functionally from a clinical perspective? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I, like if there is a slightly reduced, you, you, or if there is a reduced range of motion, you, you know, a week mm -hmm. post the dog is weight bearing, they're comfortable. Is that important? You know, exactly. It, three weeks later, that range of motion has recovered to normal, then it wasn't important. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's a good question for us to, to think about. And it's more than just edema, right? Like you say, what about range of motion? What about all the other outcome measures that we look at? Um, should we consider them to be problems or, yeah, abnormal, so close to, so close to a trauma? That's a... Yeah, and, and clinically too, you know, I, there are those handful of patients that I, that you know, the owner's lying to you, right? The owner says, oh no, my dog's been, you know, my, my dog's been on no, on restrictions and no running, jumping, and you know, you're palpating at six weeks, this, this patellar hypertrophy, um, you know, you know the dog's doing way too much than, than it should be. So, is it appropriate at that point? That would be a question for me. Those are the dogs that I see a continued lameness at four, six, eight weeks post, and sometimes, you know, occasionally beyond. Mm. Is that where cryotherapy could be more beneficial functionally with those dogs that are, are doing more? It, you know, and honestly, this question, we could use the, the same question for laser. Whole nother topic, gang. You know, a whole nother, whole nother day, Anne. Um, but you know, we could we could ask these similar questions with with utilizing laser. You know, it in in the immediate post and in longer term uh, follow up for reduction of pain and, and inflammation. Yeah, I agree with you. It comes it comes down for me to inflammation, right? Inflammation is part of the healing process and the healing timeline, and it's not a bad thing unless it's completely created. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'd love to speak a little bit about inflammation and you do touch on that, but where do we draw the line between the advantages of inflammation and the advantages of icing to mm -hmm. inhibit a little bit, tone it down a little bit? Where do we draw that line? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And it's still, you know, in my mind, it's still, for the most part, unanswered in, in our canine mm -hmm. patients. You know, if you, 
consider some of the recommendations now in the human field, they're saying use it for pain only and use it within the first 72 hours, period. So it's a whole different perspective than what it was 30, 40 years ago, or, you know, even when I went through PT school. Yeah. So it, it was a bit of an eye opener. Yeah. So most of the research that you looked at now really focused on post-operatively using ice, but there are other scenarios where we use it, right? Like, um, for example, in a, in, a, in a recovering injury, we might say, heat the area before you exercise and then apply ice after exercise. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a bit of information on that? Is that the right thing to do or not? Yeah, or <laughs> you know, I think that would be a whole nother really interesting topic is, is kind of the, the warm up and the cool down. And, you know, I, I probably haven't reviewed that literature in a really long time too. So what are the <laughs> recommendations? Gosh, you're really making me think, and they, <laughs> this is what's good. This is, this is great. You know, all this COVID stuff makes you sit down and, and think about life in general and reevaluate everything. So, so but it, it's good, you know, to, to question yourself is important. And, you know, what, what is the right protocol? So, so why don't we do that as another topic? You know, the warm up, the cool down, I think, is, is still a question out there. And, and what That's is appropriate. Right. So what was interesting, though, in the literature is talking about kind of that intermittent cooling, where they were doing five to 10 minutes of icing, and then allowing 10 to 20 minutes of rewarming, and, and then continuing that cycle maybe every two hours. Um, so that was kind of an intriguing perspective as well. Maybe we should be changing our protocol in the ICU, you know, immediately post-op. So, you know, again, no, no right or wrong answers with that, but definitely changes your perception a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The protocol for icing is like one of those things, again, where what is the right answer? How long should you be applying it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How often should you be applying it? Um, yeah. yeah. And we don't really have those, those answers, do we? No. And, and I would say, you know, from, from, Dr. Merkin, you know, they're saying use it within the first 72 hours, but, you know, frequency, duration, all of that, I think is still very questionable. And, and again, being careful to extrapolate that human data to our canine patients. We have very limited information. You know, the Draga study is probably the best one that we have from a functional capacity, but again, that's only within the first 24 hours. His protocol is only in the first 24 hours post-op. Mm -hmm. Harry, is there any evidence that is showing that we shouldn't be extrapolating um, in terms of icing the research that's done on people into animals? Like, is there anything that's giving us a red flag there and saying, hmm, this is completely a different finding? Um, maybe we should be relooking that, at that. Or yeah, that's, that's a great, great question, Renee. I Similar, you know, for, for right now, that's all we have, right? You know, we extrapolate you know, with these limited articles, these 12, 13 articles in the last 20 years, there's, there's really limited evidence in the canine patient. And until we have better evidence, that's just what we do. Um, but it's across the board. It's, it's rehab in general. It's physical therapy in general. Majority of what we've done, except for the basic biomechanics, you know, of, of tissue and tissue healing, um, we have extrapolated from human physical therapy. So why, why quit now? <laughs> Not an excuse. I know, I know. But, you know, <laughs> that's what we do. Remember that complacent slide that I talked about? You know, so, so until we have better evidence, um, nothing stood out to me that raises the red flag. And in fact, some of these intraarticular temperature studies were done in animal models again, take it for what it's worth. Who cares? You know, what does that mean functionally? Go back to that question. Ask yourself yeah. why. But critically appraise. You know, the, the, the goal of this too was to break down some of these articles rather than say, oh, here it is in the literature. I'm going to use that data. Yeah. Got to be able to critically appraise it. Yeah. Yes. I love, I love how you did that. And, and 
went back to taking a comment in the paper and going back to the references and saying, but is this really what you can take from that, yeah. <laughs> that reference and from that yeah. literature? That was a, that was a really good way for me to look at the research. I loved it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. It's, uh, it's tedious, but it's interesting. <laughs> Very time consuming. Yes. That's why yes. we do yeah. it for you guys. <laughs> woo -woo. <laughs> um, so there was one other thing that you, that you mentioned um, in the research just briefly, and that was speaking a little bit about athletes um, and a little bit about muscle inhibition um, and icing. So what do we, yeah, can you give us a little bit of information on that? How is cryotherapy affecting the human athletes? We don't have research in, in animals. Um, yeah, so, so I think the biggest the biggest issue that was discussed with, with human athletes is the risk of, of injury after cryotherapy. So you're reduce, reducing nerve conduction velocity. You're essentially reducing strength power of these athletes using cold therapy, um, whatever that is, you know, ice pack versus cold compression. And it's, it, it's inhibition essentially of the muscle. So now we're talking altered motor control. Now, if you're, you know, the biggest, the biggest one that we probably have looked at um, that's in the literature is uh, quadriceps inhibition. And what's interesting to me and what we tried to show in, in the canine patients is, you know, if there is swelling, if there is a fusion in that stifle joint, does it turn off the quad? Does it change? I shouldn't say turn off because that's what we talk about in human, but does it change muscle activation, the timing of muscle activation? which is huge in stabilization of the knee joint. So we have some preliminary data. I know it's been nine years and we've been on it. It takes forever to publish this stuff. <laughs> ah, anyway, ah, so, so, you know, there is some preliminary data that looks at alterations based on swelling. Now, I, I should say alterations in muscle activation because of a fusion or swelling within the stifle joint. Now the question becomes, um, you know, it's a multi-step research project because if we were to ice, and I don't know what that means, I don't know what the frequency, duration, type of icing, whatever that means, if we were to ice it, reduce the inflammation, does that automatically mean that our motor control is re magically restored? Oh, look, you know, the, the quadricept activation is back to 100% normal we have no clue. So here and again, you know, there's so many questions that surround this one little concept. And, you know, to, to dive into that, gosh, that would be another, you know, topic for, for all of this. And, and the motor control research related to athletes in sporting and, and return to sport. So mm -hmm. if you have that alteration in muscle activation, are we causing injury down the line? And that's, that's the bottom line with cryotherapy in, in that whole topic of discussion. Were they finding that those changes in muscle activation or nerve conduction were long-term changes or only short duration changes? Yeah, again, cold? great question. And, and, and I think it would be a great topic to dive into. I stayed on the surface because honestly, <laughs> Anae, that's a whole whole nother clinical review and research, you know, that, that's super yeah, that's a, interesting. It's, it's really a very interesting, interesting to, thing to think about how we could affect, how we could affect the, the nerve conduction and the muscle activation and, um, you know, the, per, perhaps a muscle that's um, hypertrophied. Yeah, I don't know. It's I'm, an, I'm it's, writing it down, Renee. I'm writing it down. All these different ideas, you know, that, that could be for, for future topics. And, and if anybody is interested in something, let's let's chat about it. I I nerd out on all this just as much as you guys. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, so guys, let us know what your questions are. Um, give us a shout. Pop it in the comments on Facebook or email us um, at info at online pet health. Um, we'll chat to Carrie and she'll answer the questions for you. Um, let's keep talking about this. I think it's so important that we that we question the things that we do daily, like our basic stuff, is it really what we think it is, like icing or 
passive range of motion? Is it doing what we think it's doing? And are we using it in the ways that we should be using it? And is there really evidence that shows that it's working? <laughs> so. It's good to keep yourself on your toes, guys, and, and keep questioning. That's what uh, keeps us engaged. And A, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Have a wonderful evening. You as well. Stay well. Bye. Bye. Bed rehabbers, for more information on how to take your career to the next level, go to www.onlinepetalt.com. Please don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you'll get notified. I'm here every single week talking to vet rehabbers from all over the world, learning, and I would love you to join me. Hope you have an awesome day further. Cheers for now.